A debate has risen in the field of anthropology that is questioning the very foundation upon which we analyze humans and social interaction. This debate has risen around a hypothesis entitled the social brain hypothesis, originally called the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis. The social brain hypothesis was formulated as a way to explain why the brains of primates were apparently so large in proportion to their body size. What is specifically observed is that the part of the brain experiencing the most proportional growth is the neocortex, the part of the brain largely attributed to affecting human social social behavior. But why should a primate need a larger neocortex, right? The traditional explanation for the larger brain, the evolutionary view, was that brains got bigger because greater intelligence had an evolutionary advantage, for example, allowing the animal to adapt tool usage, which in turn allowed for greater hunting success. It has subsequently been suggested, however, that the level to which our brains have evolved is far outside the scope of what constitutes survival skills, so it's something else acting on the brain. So what if not survival skills necessitates this evolved brain? The social brain hypothesis offers that these large neocortices are made necessary as a result of living in social groups with a greater number of individuals. This hypothesis rules out the possibility that brain growth is primarily a result of ecological processes. It also suggests that the brain is growing in response to outside pressures, which kind of makes it an evolutionary theory in my opinion. Robin Dunbar takes on the social brain hypothesis by presenting evidence he sees as supporting it and evidence he sees as undermining other theories. The primary line of statistical evidence that Dunbar cites is that the average social group size increases, so does the average size of the brain of individuals. What Dunbar takes this to suggest is that as a social group size of a species increases, the neocortex has to increase to accommodate for all the social interaction that's going on there. So to Dunbar, forming and maintaining a close social relationship requires a specific type of mental capacity. Thus, the more social relationships, the more of this specific mental capacity is required. Dunbar sees brain size as determined by the number of members of a social group, rather than social group size being determined by the brain. The hypothesis separates itself from evolution, however, by claiming these changes are not strictly advantageous to survival directly. The conclusion is that in the brain of the organism, there is a very significant part responsible for just maintaining social relations. Anthropologist Tim Ingold not only attacks the social brain hypothesis, but specifically Dunbar's interpretation of it and analysis. He makes many points against Dunbar and the social brain hypothesis. Here we will focus on two, which are the view of the role of the individual in relation to other beings and the view of the individual in general created by Dunbar's argument. The social brain hypothesis and Dunbar's contribution to it imply that conspecific relationships, relationships between individuals of the same species, are the only ones that have a serious impact. This is clear when Dunbar is talking about social group size because he only counts members of the same species. While perhaps a member of your species has a greater impact on your cognitive functioning overall, is it so great that relations with a member of any other species can be totally ruled out? Ingold argues that relations with other species cannot be ruled out, and that a human's interactions with dogs, cats, cows, etc. have a significant enough impact on human cognition that they cannot be excluded when considering how social interaction factors in brain development and evolution. The basis of Ingold's argument here is that every sentient being is endowed with sensory perception. With the sensory perception, living creatures take in information constantly from the environment, which includes any other living organism. Every sight, smell, sound, etc. that an organism experiences accounts for some aspect of the brain's evolution. Thus, how can we restrict analysis to one aspect of the outside environment, in this case relations with conspecific individuals? However, Ingold doesn't just criticize the Dunbar's only looking at one aspect of the outside environment, he criticizes the very foundation that there's an outside environment to start with. That is to say, that there is a fundamental separation between the individual and the outside world. While acknowledging that of course there are humans, and then there's the environment, Ingold sees the two as way more unavoidably intertwined than Dunbar does. We can compare society, society being the individual and everything in its environment, to an organism. This is like what Herbert Spencer did, but he did it to different ends. And with this, we can discover something about Ingold's view of the world. Like the individual, society consists of interdependent parts. While we can study these parts in isolation, it doesn't serve us very well to understand the whole organism. Just looking at the human heart will only give us one very small aspect of what it means to be human. We need to study not only every aspect of the organism, but how these aspects work in relation to each other. This way of thinking is in line with the view of the organism of philosopher Immanuel Kant, who sees the whole of society as being formed by the relationships between individuals, and the individuals themselves as being formed by their relationships to each other and to the whole. Some readings of this idea might conclude 
conclude that the individual kind of gets lost within the whole and that when the focus is on the whole uh, organism that there is no room for individualism. After all, if we're focusing on the relationships, are the individuals not de-emphasized in at least some way? Looking at society as the organism again shows that this is not necessarily the case. While we must analyze all of the parts of the individual to understand any individual part's function, this clearly doesn't mean that all parts are the same. The heart and the lungs are unique in their individual microcosmic functions, but similar in that they are both working to maintain the function of one organism. The interconnectivity of parts of the individual is similarly something that Engel emphasizes thoroughly, and he sees Dunbar's argument as opposing this idea. Placing so much emphasis on the underlying cognitive processes on the brain itself, Engel argues that we start to create a picture of of the human body being controlled by the brain, or in Ingold's words, the person controlling the organism. Ultimately, I believe that Dunbar's error is not in analyzing and interpreting statistical evidence. The statistical data that he presents certainly has relevance in the field of anthropology, in our study of what it is to be a primate, a human being. However, this statistical data has no bearing on its own. It must be viewed in relation to all other data collected from the field of anthropology. It's imperative that anthropologists are actively researching and collecting data in all fields, be it biological, cultural, or archaeological. Issues arise, however, when a member of a field never attempts to branch out. Data in all fields should be shared, and discussions should be taking place, for it's only then that we can start to understand the nature of living as a human being.